out. Welcome to 504. For those of you who were here, well not here, because this is a new building for me too, um, who were here last semester, this is going to be very familiar. Um, it's not going to be any different. The setup is still the same for both. But what we are going to be doing today is not really covering content. We're just going to be covering the syllabus and information about how the class can work. So um, everybody has a copy of the syllabus right now? Oh, oh. All right, so <clears throat> Physiology 504. We're going to cover cardiovascular, we're going to cover respiratory, and then we're going to cover renal. Um, they typically, um, cardiovascular tends to be the one that most people, I guess, are a little bit more familiar with. So it's a good introduction into these three heavily integrated systems. The biggest difference between 504 and 503 is that at every single unit, after we move past the first unit, you're going to notice that we're referring a lot to stuff that we covered in the previous unit. As soon as we get into respiratory, we'll talk a lot about how respiratory gases are affecting blood pressure and how heart rate can also be affected by changes in gas pressures inside of the blood. When we get into renal, the renal system is a big component to fix blood volume, regulate blood volume. So we're going to go back to hemodynamics and cardiovascular. So you're going to find that as you're going through all this content, we're going to continually build upon the material that we already finished. So even though your final exam is not cumulative, it will specifically assess specifically assess the renal system, it's not completely independent. And there will be content that we have covered before that would be helpful for you to remember. That's not to say that you're going to need to study as though you're going to be tested on every single unit. OK, so each of the exams is going to be independent in terms of overall content. You'll be tested once on cardiovascular, once on respiratory, and once on renal. Physiology is Different from anatomy, a lot of times they lump them together in an anatomy and physiology class. Anatomy is overall structure, physiology is how things work. So we're focused on physiology. We'll touch upon a little bit of anatomy, but not in the kind of detail that you would get, say, from Dr. Mosiak's uh, organ system class. Medicine is what happens if your physiology goes wonky. So <clears throat> when that happens, we're going to focus on what is normally supposed to happen, and we'll use it in the context of let's talk about what happens when it doesn't. It's a lot easier to understand how the system's going to change if you can see it in evidence and get an example of this particular condition is when we have a defect in this part of that system. Okay? So even though we're going to talk about the fundamentals of how physiology of each of these systems works, we're going to put it in the concepts of what happens, what types of conditions occur, and what are the symptoms of those conditions if your physiological system is somehow out of balance. All right, so syllabus. First and foremost, we have just the basic information on the first page that will cover, you know, basically how to contact us. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Okay, so starting off, that's me, okay? Um, that's my office phone number, my email address, and then office hours are in 319 Scott Hall. If you don't know where my office is, I'm sure you know where Natasha's is. <laughs> I am right next door, okay? So um, office hours are from 1 to 2 on Wednesdays. It's walk-in. You don't need an appointment for that time. That's not the only time I'm available. It's just the only consistent time that I make sure I don't make any other appointments and I don't schedule any other seminars to go to or give. That is time reserved for 504 for office hours. Okay? That doesn't mean that you can't come in. I'm here every day of the week. Um, it's just not always consistent. Sometimes there are seminars or workshops that, I, that I'm going to that will take me out of the office. So, if you can't come to regular office hours because you have a class or something, just send me an email. We can always schedule another appointment, okay? Um, next, I'm going to introduce Corey. We actually have TAs this year, so very exciting time. Um, this is the first year that I had a TA, but then in 503, we had 
actually last semester. Corey is our TA for this semester. So here is his uh, email address, and he will introduce himself. All right, so good morning, everyone. Um, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Corey. I'm in second year in the Biz program, and I'm graduating this semester, so that's exciting. And um, so right now, I just kind of take this moment to uh, just kind of like list out some expectations that you all may have of me. So I will be having office hours, just because I'm not on the syllabus yet. Um, I haven't determined a day or time that I'm you know, most available. So that will be that information will be determined soon and sent out to you all. And I would also like to say um, I encourage all of you to you know come visit me so we can discuss you know like various studying strategies that I used um, to do well in five four. And also just discuss um, any questions that you may have about the concepts or material. And I will say that this class in particular, compared to five or three, so this is much more substance based, as Dr. Bork has um, explained earlier. And so what's really important about this class is just that you're going to have to be able to synthesize and integrate all this information that, you, that you're learning and be able to apply it in a systems-based format. So please come see me in my office or hers, especially, and I highly recommend um, that you also go to Dr. B's office hours because it is she who writes the exams. And lastly, um, I will also be holding bi-weekly review sessions. So if you take in five or three, um, Ashley did review sessions before each exam, but I will be having more spaced out review sessions. So maybe after three or four lectures, then I'll have that review session for those lectures. And yeah, I think that's all I wanted to touch on. So I hope everyone has a great semester. Thank you. Yes, that is actually based, the more frequent review sessions is based on feedback from, like I said, last semester was the first time we ever had a TA. So it was the first time we could offer review sessions. Um, but one of the pieces of information that, um, feedback that I got was that uh, some students wish that it were earlier before the exam, instead of just a review session for the exam, that it were a little bit earlier going over content. So we're going to space them out a little bit more so that um, there'll be, you know, two probably or maybe three, depending on how difficult the content is. And we will work on scheduling that in a room like we did last semester. Um, but it will be more frequently throughout the course of the unit so that you guys can have at least a review session to sort of help solidify any of the questions that you haven't gotten from different and I will send out an email. Um, there is a listserv, so I, I set that up. It should be through the system by now. But I will send out an email with the date and time of his office hours. And on the off chance that you're meeting outside of normal office hours for TA office hours, um, you know you will want to send him an email to contact coordinating that. But uh, he will have an office space like Ashley did across the hall from my office. So that's also a, a location that all of you should be aware of by the end of the semester. Okay, now, let's see, I'll go back to here and talk a little bit about our course expectations. <clears throat> the 503504 is really building on college level physics and chemistry. That's going to become more evident in the cardiovascular especially and when we get to respiratory because we're going to talk about um, the difference between partial pressure of gases and the concentration of gases in a dissolved liquid. So, a little bit of chemistry in there. Our physics is going to come into play when we talk about hemodynamics. The flow, pressure, and resistance is very similar to voltage, current, and resistance from Ohm's law. So, we're going to be touching upon a lot of that. You don't necessarily have to go back and get out your old physics book, but it might help just to refresh your memory about what all of these different concepts are and how they're related to each other. 451 and 553 are recommended prereqs. They're not required prereqs because I'm not actively going to test you on the biochemistry of gene expression. We have a whole class that you're required to take that's on that, so that's not my job. Um, but there is some information from there that would be helpful. So if you want to review that content without going through the thousands of pages of notes you probably have from 553, there are, it's I never remember if it's chapter three or four in which textbook. For one of the books, it's chapter three, for one, it's chapter four. Um, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the textbooks in just a second. But in the textbook <coughs> of medical physiology, which used to be the required textbook, so you'll notice that the lecture titles on the syllabus are very similar to the chapter titles in the textbook of medical physiology. Um, the Guyton Hall is a good beginning resource. It's got a lot of good clinical relevance. The Boren and Volpeck book, which I'll talk about in just a second, is the other one that also has this chapter. It's basically G 
gene expression, regulation of gene expression. There's an entire chapter in each of these books that just summarizes 553. So it can give you some of that foundation if you haven't had it yet. Um, so recommended textbooks. You don't have a specific required textbook because you should never get all of your information from a single source. But there are several recommended books, and I will <coughs> tell you right now that the difference between these, the feedback that I've gotten from multiple students is that everybody seems to like or prefer one of the textbooks that's different from the other ones. So starting at the top, the top, the textbook of medical physiology, that used to be the required textbook for the class. The good thing about this one is you have the actual textbook itself. There is a companion guide, so it's sort of like bullet points for each chapter, and it summarizes the entire textbook. It's like 20 bucks, I think, if you want to buy it. It's a good thing to carry around with you if you just want to read up before coming to class. It also has the physiology review, which is right underneath there. So the Guyton Hall Physiology Review is a book that accompanies the textbook that has multiple choice questions. So it gives you a chance to practice <coughs> multiple choice questions on the content that's covered, a lot of the stuff that we're going to do. Um, the nice part about this is that in the answer key, it tells you not just what the correct answer is, but it explains why that's the correct answer. And if you're still not really sure, at the bottom it'll say TMP13, which is Textbook of Medical Physiology, 13th edition. And it'll give you the page number that that information is on. So you can go back to the actual textbook and take a look at the content that led to that question. So that's a good resource to take from. The third one on the list here is medical physiology. That's the Born and Gold Cup. That one I really, really like. Okay? It's very, very detailed. We go into a lot of molecular detail, and that's the one you're going to want to go to to get a lot of that molecular detail, especially for respiratory. <clears throat> but those two are the ones that I kind of flip back and forth between. They contain the bulk <coughs> of the information. No single textbook is going to give you all of the information that there is, because every book is written by the authors geared toward a specific audience. Okay? The medical physiology textbook of Florida Bullpep is <coughs> giving you a lot of the background of research. How did we come up with this information? What were the experiments that helped to lead to the molecular stuff that we learned? The Guyton Hall gives you a lot of clinical relevance, some examples of how you can apply this information. Guyton Hall does a good job when we get to the ECGs, talking about vectorial analysis. Born and Bullpep just shows you I'm looking triangle and kind of leaves it at that. So those are going to be the two that <laughs> I like best for the content overall. You will also notice that as we're going through content, um, we'll have a figure up on the screen. And a lot of times I will say, this one came from Born and Bullpep. This one came from the Guyton Hall. So if you wanted to go and look up that particular figure and read the information surrounding it that's in that textbook, that's also critical. <coughs> the bottom two are the Burton Levy physiology and then the Costanzo physiology. Costanzo is a really good catch-all, sort of a halfway in between the boron and the guide. It doesn't go into as much molecular detail, but it does a really, really good job of explaining systems. She is sort of the go-to person for board prep. Okay. She has a board review series. She actually runs like an eight-hour step one review session at the medical school that she teaches at. So that's Linda Costanzo. That's the one on the bottom there. That's a really good kind of catch-all this book. Um, and then the Burn and Levy is if you are going through some of the content and it gives you a really good overview. A lot of times it's used for upper-level undergrad. So if you're struggling with some of the content, if you're looking in the Warren book and it just seems a little too dense and a little too complex, the burden line is a good place to get the foundations, and then you can expand upon to fill in those details. These are all going to be out of reserve at the library. I don't know if they are up yet, but they have, they're in the system to be processed. I think the Boron book is in the ebook that they already have a copy of, so that should already be available. But all of these are going to be on reserve, so you can uh, go to the library and just use your Unity ID to get it online or go uh, sign it out. So all of these are going to be available. I think the Physiology Review is also an electronic resource. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yes? Okay. So that's something else that you can download. Um, the other thing about the e-books, different e-books have different limitations on what you can download. I do know that the Boron book allows you to download like up to 60 pages at a time. I don't know what the semester cap is, but 
you could download an entire chapter. So if you prefer to print something out or you know put it on a tablet or something so you can annotate, that's also an option for some of the ebooks. Anybody have any questions on books?
So you're going to know what the answers are right at the end of class because you're going to take the exact same quiz together where you guys can talk about it. You can scratch off your little scratch off cards like lottery tickets. Okay, you're going to scratch those off and then the benefit of that is it gives you a chance to have partial credit. So based on the number of times it takes your team to get to the right answer, you can get partial credit for that. So that will help you kind of discuss you know, maybe one person put A, one person put C, and they both are vehement that they are correct. Your job then is to try and convince everybody else by talking about what you have studied in order to arrive at that answer. Okay, so it's a little bit of a time for you guys to discuss and work together to learn how each of you guys explain different things and how everybody studied. So by the end of that first class on Tuesday, you'll have already finished 75% of the assessment grade points for that TDL module, okay? Then on Thursday, you come in and you get what's called your application exercises, or your case studies. That is where you'll get a scenario, you know, you have this patient comes in and here are the symptoms, here are the lab results, depending on what the content is, and you'll get a series of questions that are specific to the particular patient that you've been presented with, okay? There are usually three, sometimes four cases that you'll run through, it's still only 10 questions, but it's all done in your team. So it gives you a chance at applying the stuff that you covered on Tuesday in terms of a medical case study, okay? So those are done immediately before the exam. And it's scheduled the way that it is so that we finish lectures on a Thursday and you still have four free days, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, before the first TBL. The TBL is the week immediately before the exam and then you finish the TBL on Thursday, and you still have those four free days before the exam, okay? And the reason for that is that by the time we finish lectures to the time we have the exam, you've got 12 days between the end of content and your actual exam assessment, okay? And the TBL module gives you a chance at kind of feeling out how well you understand the content that you've studied for the TBL, which is part of what would be on the exam. Any reading assignments you get assigned for the TBL specifically, are not, um, are not reading assignments that you have to do for the exam. You might get something outside the scope of what we talked about in lecture because it's going to be pertinent for the case that you're going to be doing, but that won't be something that you would have to know also for the exam. Okay? Does anybody have any questions about TBLs? I know we have quite a few people here who are not in 503, so this might be new for you. None? I usually try to put at least one person in every group who's had a semester of physiology before, so you can help guide your group to understand how everything is run. Um, so hopefully everybody, since we have enough people from 503 that are now in 504, we should have enough people to be able to make sure that every group has somebody who has some familiarity with this. All right, no other questions? Okay. All right, great. Um, this is the part that uh, is, always seems to be the most tricky, despite the fact that I think most of you have had statistics. Um, the biggest thing about the uh, course grades is that the actual letter grades are assigned based on the cohort of students that are in this class. Okay? Um, because for the rest of you know, you're in graduate school right now. We're done with undergrad. We are now in a graduate level environment, which means part of your training in graduate school is to prepare you for the expectations and the realities that you're going to see as you move forward. And for the rest of your careers, you are going to be assessed on whether or not you get admission to a program or you get hired for a job or you get promoted. They're going to assess you if based on a minimum level of criterion, everybody needs to have these. And then, of the candidates that all have met that minimum requirement, they're gonna look and see who's the best candidate for the job, who's the best candidate for admission. So, the actual raw scores on exams don't matter as much as where you stand relative to your cohort of students. Every semester we have different group of students coming in and grades will range based on experience levels. We do have a group of people from a cluster of people that maybe all came from the same university. We have a few of those that a lot of universities will send students 
to the program. Okay, you'll have a lot of people from UNC, you'll have people from ECU, you'll have people from App State, you'll have people from Elon. You'll have people from all over that are um, in North Carolina. But we have enough diversity in your undergraduate experience and your undergraduate major that this, this course sequence is designed as the capstone project for the entire program. So it's supposed to get everybody from wherever you came in to cultivate the skills that you need to make you a competitive candidate for a professional school. And also to make sure that you can succeed once you're actually there. So the grading assessment is you're going to get, after every exam, you'll get an email that has the, the statistics. It'll tell you what the mean is on the exam and what the standard deviation is. No, letter grades are not assigned until the end of the semester. Okay? But you can get a rough estimate of where you are relative to the class based on the statistics. The average level of understanding for an undergrad, since D minus still gives you course credit, would be about a C plus, right? C plus, B minus is sort of the middle of the road. For grad school, anything below a C minus doesn't count as course credit, okay? You still have that count towards your GPA, but those credits don't count towards your plan of work. Because of that, the average level of understanding by definition in grad school is a B. Okay? So for the B, I curve it to the middle of the B range. So whatever the mean is, that's the equivalent of the middle of the B. If you get a full standard deviation above, you're in the middle of the A range. A full standard deviation below, you're in the middle of the C range. The pluses and minuses are divvied up based on the normal ratio that you see for a 10-point scale. Okay? Um, that might be the last time person we're having computer issues when we first started. Okay. <laughs> yeah, for those of you that uh, you know weren't here before the door was propped open, apparently those doors in the back were open this morning, but these doors were locked. So um, I guess we'll have to figure out how to get those. I'm assuming there's an outdoor staircase, probably right out here. Uh, but just so that you guys know, if you ever come in this door locked, if you go up the staircase, then you should be able to come into the back. Okay. All right, so for a normal 10-point scale, so let's say we're doing the 80 to 90, okay? That's your B range. All right, so under normal circumstances, this is equivalent to a B minus a B and a B plus, okay? So three points, four points, three points. That is the ratio that you typically see on an uncurved 10 point grading scale, okay? This is what is applied to whatever the standard deviation is. So if our standard deviation is 12, this B minus would um, span 3.6, 4.8, 3 3.6. We can always run through uh, some of these examples after, uh, after class if you want to run through exactly how you would go through calculating them. But basically the middle, in 85, that is what is the mean. Whatever the mean is, is equivalent to an 85. Okay, the middle of that B range. All right, so you could get a little bit below the mean or a little above the mean and still be within that mean range. But depending on what the standard deviation is, that's what's going to help us understand how far you have to attain or lose before you drop to the next letter grade level. The most important thing to pay attention to is what your final raw score average is because that's what letter grades are going to be based on. Letter grades aren't assigned throughout the course of the semester because that would involve rounding and lumping everybody with a B minus in together. If you were at the upper end of the B minus, that would actually hurt you, right? Because you were close to that B, but not quite. So <clears throat> all of your scores are raw scores until the end of the semester. And that's when everything is fine. <clears throat> Does anybody have any questions about this so far? I'm sure everybody will have questions after the first exam. And that's fine. And <laughs> we can run through it again if you want to come into office hours. I can walk you through exactly what the ranges would look like for um, a particular grade relative to the mean standard deviation. Okay. All right. 
All right, so attendance, strongly recommended because your exams are from Washington. But you don't actually have to be here. You guys are adults. It's up to you if you come to lecture or not. <coughs> you have a flat tire, you have something else that you have to do during that time. You don't need permission to miss a regular lecture session, okay? I will take attendance, but just to get an idea of how many people are typically here. Even if you're here and you don't sign in, it's not gonna hurt you. It's not, I don't ever look at it until the end of the semester just to get an idea of how many people roughly are signing in at the end of the term. It's more for my understanding of class dynamics. But you do have to be here on days that you have a TBL module or you have an exam. So anytime we have an assessment, you have to. If you have to miss for something, like you have to go for a conference, or you got sick, or uh, you have an interview, that would be a really good reason for having to miss, right? All you need to do is send me an email with the appropriate documentation. Um, that is listed in the syllabus. It tells you the website that lists all of the um, acceptable, excusable absences by the university. So with the university policy, that written documentation has to be provided in order to excuse your absence. If you miss a TBL, you don't make it up. It just is omitted from the calculation of your grade. So let's say you missed the case study from TBL 1 because you had an interview for federal school or dental school. That means that the case study grade for your final average for the whole course is going to be based on case studies for TBLs 2 and 3 instead of 1 and 2 and 3. Because you're doing it in the team and because the individual quiz and the team quiz are given together, it's not something that can be made up. So that's why it's just omitted from your grade calculation. But you don't get a zero for it. A zero might show up on the website, but it's not factored in. For exams, you can make those up, and you should, because it's 25% of your grade. But if you provide the uh, adequate documentation, then we can schedule a makeup exam um, for whatever time happens to work for you and for me so that I can proctor it. Um, yeah, I think that about covers the attendance. So attendance, not required for regular lecture sessions, but it is required for any TBL modules. Any questions about that? These are other policies that uh, we have to include in the syllabi just to make sure that everybody's on the same page. <clears throat> Email policies. Um, it says response will be within one week of receipt. So whenever you send it, I can respond within a week. Usually I will respond faster than that. But sometimes you might email me to ask me a question. It might be a policy question where I have to contact somebody else and get a response from them before I can actually answer your question. But I will respond to you within that week. If you're just emailing me to ask me to set up a meeting, <clears throat> the next time I'm sitting down checking my email, I usually have my calendar open and I will write you back pretty quickly. Um, if you have questions about course material, content, those should be brought to office hours or set up a meeting to come in and talk about it, mainly because an email question doesn't usually tell the whole story. Sometimes you have a very specific question as you're studying something, but if we talk about it, I can ask you a few questions and understand that maybe there's something else that's missing and we can answer all the questions in one fell swoop. Plus, the way you phrase a question might not be exactly what you mean and you might not get the answer that you were hoping for or that you expected, <coughs> and then it will lead to more follow-up questions. So the best way to handle that is to come in to office hours either with me or with Corey, set up a time, either walk in office hours or set up a meeting, and just run through questions. If you have a list of questions, I'm cool with that. Just come in and say, you know, here, I, I don't understand these things. We'll run through it. If you don't have any specific questions, you can still come into office hours and say, can I just tell you what I know? And you poke holes in it, I'm happy to do that too. Just walk through and say, here's what I understand. Then I'll ask you some questions to make sure that you can really flesh out the areas that you might not be as strong on. Okay, so you don't have to have specific questions to come to office hours or even to set up a meeting. <clears throat> Adverse weather. Highly unexpected that this happened in the fall. It never happened in the fall. <laughs> but that freak storm that we had in December caused us to have a final exam on Sunday afternoon. So decisions about class sessions that will follow whatever the university says. If, by chance, the university says, we'll leave it up to the instructor. 
you know, I will make a decision based on whatever that case is. Chances are, um, I, I probably won't be too mean about that. I, for those of you who have asked me this before, I am from up north, so snow driving in it doesn't really scare me that much. But I have also been down here, I've been down here long enough to know that there's no reason for a place that gets such infrequent snow to maintain the equipment to clear the roads. So a lot of times the side streets where you might be living aren't going to be clear. So I will take that into consideration when making the decision about this. Um, I don't know. With the weather we've been having, I'm not sure if we're going to have another issue, but I never expected to have that in December either. So um, we'll follow whatever the university says. If they leave it up to me, we'll figure it out. Okay? So don't, don't worry about um, that. I will always send an email to let you know as soon as I have information about that as well. All right, <coughs> course website. Uh, so the university um, is has promoted through Delta trying to switch over to uh, Top Hat for the past few years. That's the joint code. You all should have gotten an email from me with the information for the, the website and the link to be able to sign on. Those of you who already did will notice that the syllabus was already up there. Signed for review, so you could have downloaded that. Lecture slides are going to be available uh, in real time as they're being presented, like right now. If you were looking at your device, you could see them on your device in real time. <clears throat> but one of the things that I did take into account was that we do have a few, um, a few slides that are very complex figures that probably, even though you're supposed to have an annotation function, it doesn't appear to always be working well. I can't have a student account since we use our Unity login. I have no way of generating a student account that I can log into a computer and see what your view is. All I can see is what my view is. And I can annotate <laughs> But for some reason, um, there seems to be a problem with annotating a feature for um, iPad apps or tablet apps and, uh, on the website. So um, there will be select complex figures that will be uploaded before class that you can download it for now. One of them is already available for Thursday's class. It's the Wigger's diagram or the um, pressure volume diagram, which I'll show you in just a second. The other thing that is up already, which I think I'll just show you. Um, so, so this is the first figure that's under that heading that is available for Thursday. A lot of the other figures are pretty straightforward. Part of the reason why you get access to the slides in real time and then you get them after class is because when talking with faculty at medical schools, one of the biggest learning curves, steepest learning curves that they find in their students is that they have a really tough time learning on the fly after they have already been sitting and have just been regurgitating and listening to the same lectures over and over again and have been handed all of the information beforehand. When I was talking with some of the physicians over at UNC and at Duke, they said that we don't do that when we do rounds. You walk into a patient's room and we don't hand you all the stuff that you're gonna to need to know. You need to be able to take notes on the fly, you need to be able to think on the fly, and process and prioritize information about what you're gonna write down. That said, some of the figures that we use, I understand are actually pretty complicated. So I picked out the ones like this that would be really hard for you to redraw or even sketch in your notes so that you can have a copy of this before and print it out if you decide to do that. Um, it won't be the entire lecture file, but it will be a lot of the big key uh, complicated readers. The important part of being able to take notes in real time is that it allows you to cultivate skills that are going to be necessary as you go on into professional, academic, or clinical environments or even research environments. Um, this is the only one I think for the first lecture. But as you can see, there are several other figures that will be available after each lecture. All right, so the other thing that's up here are learning objects. So this is actually uploaded as a PDF Word file. Um, it was a Word file that converted to a PDF, so it's not actually a slide, which is why it's kind of small. But, this is uh, going to give you an idea of what we're really covering in each lecture. 
so you can read through and get a feel for, by the end of this lecture, these are some of the things that you should be able to do. So it gives you a feel for the kinds of stuff that we're going to cover. That's already available for um, the entire first year. So just lectures two through eight, and it walks you through exactly what we're going to cover. Now, just because some of them only have a few learning objectives doesn't mean that the lecture is any shorter. Lecture five is basically all stuff about ECG, and it is, well, you can ask Corey, how was the ECG content learning how to do the cardiac axis? Pretty brief, actually. It was pretty brief, but how did you analyze it? Did it take a while to figure out how to analyze it? Yeah, I ended up looking at this online source and had like multiple methods. <laughs> you want to say that louder? Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I just found this online source um, that had like these different methods, and so I just kind of used that to, you know, just kind of come up with this way of doing it myself, essentially. So online sources are, you know, it's a good thing. They can be helpful. They can be really helpful. Um, it's also important to be discerning to make sure that you don't get something that is incomplete, but there are a lot of sources that will um, help as kind of augment the stuff that we cover, but with the ECG stuff, it's not a very long lecture, but you will be given an ECG to look at, and you'll have to look at the shape of everything and be able to figure out where the cardiac axis is relative to an actual readout that you have. So just because the learning objectives are a little bit shorter doesn't mean that there's not enough content there. Um, OK, so that's already available. Oh yeah, I think the default when I um, the default when I assign it for review is that when I upload it, it doesn't have it download downloadable. That happened. Um, somebody told me that last semester for one of the lectures that I had uploaded, and they weren't able to download it. Thank you for reminding me. So that's something I can I can follow. Right. So okay, so. Course website, uh, exam grades, TBL grades, everything will be uploaded to here as well. And it's something that you will be able to uh, sign into and see um, how the overall grade, it, uh, what your grades are after I have input all of them. One thing I will caution you against don't look at whatever the grade book tells you is your grade. Okay? That's not your because it's going to factor in all of the in-class questions that we have. So I'll ask you a question during class, and you'll be given you know, half a point for participation, like if you participated at all. And you'll be given half a point for credit if you got it correct. Top Hat automatically factors that in. Okay? That's why there's a whole separate folder that just says grades. That's the only stuff that's going to matter for your actual grade for the class. But Top Hat will tell you that you have like a 40 in the class, even though you got higher than that on the exams, and that's because maybe you didn't you didn't answer any of the questions during lecture. You're not required to answer any of them. You're not graded on that actually. Okay? So don't don't look at what the actual overall grade is. It's going to depend on whether or not you participated in any of the lecture questions. Alright. Um, the last part that I want to introduce uh, has to do with actually taking notes, overall notes. Uh, by hand. I understand that there's a lot of content that we covered. You will notice that I repeat myself a lot during lecture. That's intentional. Um, I do repeat myself a lot during lecture mainly because I understand that sometimes you might not catch something the first time when I say it, so I'll reiterate that exact same piece of information. If I say something more at the time, it's probably important. But I also know that sometimes I will say something that is important. I will try to remember to catch myself and make sure that I repeat everything. But you'll notice I do repeat a lot. One of the things I want to point out about handwriting is there have been numerous studies about the benefits, the cognitive benefits of physically writing something down versus typing. There are a lot of companies that are trying to develop a keyboard that will tap into that same evolutionary learning developmental uh, feature that we have, where as you handwrite something, you have to process it on a deeper level just by the process of writing it out longhand. So even if you type during class or you type taking notes, at some point, get on a blank sheet of paper, get on a whiteboard, 
write stuff down, draw some things, it will help you to solidify it. One of the things I used to do was I would actually take my notes and I would rewrite them just highlighting key points, key features of each section that I wrote. And it just doing that helped me to understand the content and also provided me with a cheat sheet or study sheet for the actual exam that was an abridged version of my notes. So things like that will help. But I do recommend that at some point in your studying process, handwriting things will help you to process stuff in a way that typing just can't get. All right, the last part, the final part, hierarchy of cognitive learning. How many people have seen Bloom's taxonomy? A few people have seen this? All right, so remembering stuff, understanding it, and applying it to a similar situation that you were taught in class. This is the crux of a lot of stuff that you do as an undergrad. You know, you're introduced to new stuff. First question, can you remember what you learned? That's your rote memorization, R-O-T-E. Study it numerous amounts of times. The more time you study it, the more likely you are to remember it. Anybody heard of the Ebbinghaus forgetting her? A couple people, a couple million. All right, so it, Ebbinghaus uh, did a study about how repetition can help you to remember. So if a group of people are given a series of like eight numbers, and they say, here, study this for 15 minutes, then you come back the next day without looking at it at all, can you write them down in the correct order? Usually you're going to remember about 20%, you'll get about 20% of that correct. If you study it for the first day, and then you come back 24 hours later and study it again, then as you get tested and as you move further out, you test tested on the same exact thing a day later, a week later, a month later, you remember a higher percentage. So the first thing to do is make sure that you can understand all this content. Cramming doesn't work. Okay, when you go to sleep, that's when your short-term memory of all the stuff that you did during the day gets converted to long-term memory. Everybody seen Inside Out? Right? Cartoons, Pixar? Let's get these memories down the long term. Okay? That's what happens. <laughs> um, seriously, they consulted neuroscientists when they were making the movie. That's what happens. You take a lot of sensory information in during the day. It gets processed by your brain while you sleep. Some of them will go with a long-term memory, some of them won't. So that's why cramming is usually not a good idea. If you do a little bit each day, you're more likely to remember everything. Um, rote memorization is great, but I'm not going to ask you to spit back information. Anybody who took 503 will know that I will ask you questions to make sure that you really understand exactly what's going on. So, Understanding is the next part, and applying it will give some examples of application during class, but we'll also make sure that um, we run through a few scenarios, but this is still considered a lower order of cognitive thinking. So we will be doing some of this, but most of what we're going to be doing is the analyzing, the evaluating. We won't be doing so much of the creating. The creating is sort of for PhD students. Um, I think everybody that took my son this class has graduated by now because it's the first special topics I did. That one I actually ran a little bit more like a PhD class where I would give you guys, I would give a series uh, a question like, how would you write an experiment to test for how to figure out what's going on? We don't know this, how would you address that? That's more the creating side. We will do the analyzing and the evaluating. That's going to be where you are given questions that are not really something necessarily that we talked about explicitly in class, but all of the information that we talked about in class and the scenarios that we gave to apply it in class are the tools that you would need in order to answer the questions that are given. You'll find that on the TVL. So that's why it's your first introduction into how to take all of the stuff you've learned to that next level. Okay? So we're going to spend most of our time up here in the analyzing and evaluating side mostly in the analyzing side, a little bit in the evaluating. We'll do some of the applying, but there's very little that will just be the remembering and understanding. Okay? That is the end of this part, but don't go yet. Very quickly, the actual schedule. Um, so, we have our, as you'll see, all of our lectures here are before the first TBL. The first TBL will be that first week of February, and then we'll have our exam right after that. Our exams are always going to be on a Tuesday during the semester, intentionally, because I want to make sure that you finish the TBL and that you have a full, long weekend before we actually have the exam. 
Our final exam is going to be from 8 to 11 in this room. It's on Thursday, May 2nd. Okay, so write that down now. Um, this is going to be an early morning. You need to be here by 8.20 in order to be allowed in. Okay, so put it on your schedule, set your alarms, months in advance, don't wait. Um, the last part, if you are curious about overall learning objectives, here are a few select for the entire semester. This sort of summarizes everything for the entire term, so it can give you a little bit of a preview of what we're going to do in respiratory and renal, but you will have lecture-specific learning objectives for each unit.